This is Tommy Buckley from Crowbar and Soylent Green, and you're watching Josh's Metal Monday. I'll tell you what, um, probably um, my, one of my favorite, uh, I'll, I'll say tours, uh, I had a good time on the Carcass tour, man. We toured with uh, Carcass and Ghoul and a band from uh, somewhere in California, dude. I think they're like from Sacramento, California or something called Night Demon. And it's actually right. Kirk, Kirk, and, Kirk Winstein and myself's new favorite band, dude. They're great. Oh, right on. But that was probably that was probably some of my best shows in a while. We had a great time. Made me feel young again. <laughs> and uh, you know, other than that, we did a show two years ago, 2014, uh, in Germany, in the middle of uh, a motor speedway called Hockenheim Ring, and we opened up for a band, the biggest, the hugest German band that no one's ever heard of, called Bo's Uncles. And uh, it was it was Crowbar, Limp Biscuit. And Bo's uncles in front of like 100,000 tickets two days in a row. But the first day, Soulfly played the first show, and Crowbar played the second show, and Lent Biscuit played both days in front of Bo's uncles. But there was 100 tickets sold for both days. And when we went on, when we went on stage with Crowbar, it was probably about 75,000 people. So that was probably one of my most notable gigs other than Soul and Green playing the Beast Feast in uh, Japan in 2001. You know, after you play so many gigs, it just kind of fades away. It's kind of like a natural thing. Plus, I can hide behind a couple drums <laughs> and cymbals. But uh, sometimes for me, um, if I do get a little stage fright, which, hey, it happens every now and then. You know, you get a little nervous in front of these big shoes. And, um, you know, I'm like a dog running around from one side of the yard to the other uh, wearing a trail in the grass. I'll pace the dressing room for a couple minutes, but then uh, usually I'm fine when I get on stage and, I'm really nervous. I'll just look at my drum heads and my cymbals and nothing else. <laughs> and uh, it usually helps you get through the gig, but it's uh, actually better for me because it helps me concentrate better on what I'm doing. Well, we toured with Metalocalypse for the Death Clock tour on Adult Swim tour okay. back in 2008, like in the summer, for about, a, uh, about four and a half weeks, almost five weeks. And um, we met a couple of the guys from Adult Swim. They were coming out to a couple of the shows. And uh, I was probably in Atlanta where they were from, where they're from, where Adult Swim's from. And uh, we met one of the guys up in the office, and, and Ben just kept – Ben Falgu for Soul and Green just kept chirping in his ear, squid billies, squid billies, squid billies. <laughs> and finally, I mean, it was a few months later after the tour, maybe five or six months later, but when they decided to do uh, season three – Episode one was called Lerm, L-E-R-M, and uh, we did that episode. It was the first season for volume three, but uh, it was pretty cool. They just approached us, called us up one day. We're like, hey, y'all want to do the uh, you know, theme song for Squidbillies? And we were excited. We were like, sure, man. It was great. It was, a, you know, for an underground band like Saul and Green to get something like that was pretty big for us. And, you know, they, uh, they actually, uh, we actually got paid – a little bit of change for it wasn't much, but hey, dude, it's it's nice getting to be paid anything for what you do. So it was okay. fun, and uh, they were very professional about it, and it was really cool to do. That's Fuck awesome. Hey, that's real. I didn't even know that, dude. That's awesome. Yeah, we did about ten different versions. I used to call it one was like the Zeppelin version, one was like the Pink Floyd version, one was like the Black Sabbath version, like Doom. Uh, one was like uh, we did a reggae version. <laughs> we, did, we did all those crazy things, and uh, if you actually buy the DVD, Volume 3, um, the Lost Episodes, it's called. It's a green cover. Um, they actually have all the outtakes on the art and music gallery uh, section. Oh, wow. So if you go on that, they actually got a version of me singing the theme song. I actually got a vocal track on that doing vocals. Dude, that's <laughs> sick. <laughs> 
and you can pick it out because I it's I can pick out every soil and green version, even the ones with no vocals. But uh, there's a version on there with me doing vocals. Uh, it'll be out actually October 28th, and uh, man, it's a ripper, dude. It's my favorite one out of all three crowbar records that I did, uh, Seven of the Wicked Hand, Symmetry in Black, and the new one, Ser The Serpent Only Lies. Um, I think it's the strongest production. I think it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty good on the songwriting. I think the songs are really strong. I think they're better than the last record, and the production's like, it pretty much smokes Sever and Symmetry. It's it's our best. I think it's the best sounding crowbar record ever, honestly. Oh, I heard the leak, the leak tracks are awesome. Yeah, the drum sounds are huge, man, you know, and uh, I told the producer, Dwayne Simino, it's our third record we did with him, so we know him well, he knows us well, and we work great together, and he knows what we want and what we should sound like, and he gets better every record, and, you know, we want this shit to sound larger than life, so when you're doing something for a major label recording, you got to have a major label sound, it has to sound larger than life. So that's what we that's what we like to go for a larger than life sound. You got to go for something that sounds huge, especially for crowbar. Well, Kirk and them sometimes you know, they got to crack the whip on their own selves. You know, I mean, you know, everybody has private lives and other things they have to do. So sometimes when it gets down to crunch time, you just got to get down and do it. And sometimes. Other songs or other riffs may come easier than others. So, you know, when it gets down to that, usually we work really good under pressure. That's one good thing about Crowbar. We don't even have to – sometimes we won't even be in the jam room together for like 12 weeks, like three months, and we'll get back in and do a rehearsal. And it might be one or two minor mistakes. It's like we never stop jamming one day. We'll all look at each other and just kind of shrug our shoulders and go, all right, man, cool. Well, actually, we toured with uh, Disarray was Dave's band back in 2002. And it was Disarray, Soil and Green, and Gwar. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, knock on wood, when we had our second van accident, it was ironic. I was just telling those guys in Disarray about our first van accident that night. And we had another second van accident. Ben fell asleep behind the wheel. And, man, a lot of people know that. It's a lot of history. But um, a lot of people don't know that the second accident is not the first accident. People thought the second accident was the first accident. They thought it was just one. It was actually two separate accidents. But uh, that's how we met Dave and on that. Uh, that was a rough tour for us. We had to go home two weeks out of a four-week tour with the Gore tour because of that. But uh, nonetheless, dude, it was uh, made a great friend in Dave. And lo and behold, all these years later, man, we, you know, we stayed in touch for years, and he took care of me, man. He took me on as the first person he ever endorsed for his, uh, you know, company so i'm grateful man nice that shit seems to be blowing up fast too man i hope so for him man you know all i'm i'm just one player all i can do is this word of mouth and try to give every cracked stick away and broken stick and and just tell people what they are where they came from and how they made where they made who makes them and you know i try to help them out as much as i can man you know i'm grateful uh, i used to have an endorsement with another stick company and kind of fell through the cracks, so, you know, he picked me up and, uh, you know, pretty much happy with it, man, you know, and he takes care of me. So, you know, props to him, and I wish him the best, man. I'll try to do anything I can to help him out, you know. Yeah, man, Dave was a good good old down-to-earth homeboy, that's for sure, man, from Tennessee. But uh, he's a good friend of mine. I, like I said, I'm grateful, man. He's taking on some drummers like Blue, Joey from War Beast, which is the drummer for Super Giant Ritual, taking oh, on Jimmy, Jimmy Bauer from Down. Uh, you know, Henry uh, Vasquez, uh, Vasqua, whatever the hell it is, from uh, from um, St. Vitus. And um, anyhow, man, some pretty big mid-level drumming names, you know, and Down's pretty big for them, you know. You know what? My favorite song to play at Crowball Live, and it's really kind of simple as it is, is... Uh, of course, it's got to be Planets Collide. Uh, it's it's really like a Curveball's national anthem, <laughs> you know. Uh, we, you know, they, we always fly that song proud, bro. That and uh, all I had, I gave. It's kind of like the two Ace of Spades. You can't really get rid of them out your set, dude. You got to <laughs> play them. 
people would be very upset if you didn't play those two songs every night. So, you know, like Phil Lennett from Thin Lizzy said uh, back in the day, if you just really want to get the posers out the club, you just come out ripping the boys are back in town. That way all the posers can leave. So, <laughs> sometimes we just come right out, dude. In the last tour, we started off playing something else like Conquering, and it ended up every night being All I Had I Gave. So we were like, if you came just to see All I Had I Gave, then basically you can go home after the first song. So just kind of <laughs> weed out all the fakes and the posers by getting out the obvious songs, but uh, usually Planets Collides toward the end, you know, it's always, always has to be. Uh, I think it affected us a lot, you know, and um, not, not to try to draw any kind of certain music or skin colors into this thing, but like Kirk always jokes around with me and he always says, uh, you know, we joke around about Jimmy Bauer, Craig Nunemacher, and myself, and, you know, the longtime New Orleans drummers that grew up here and that, that are from here and lived here all their lives. You know, Kirk's like, I think y'all got a little bit of R&B and soul and a little bit of uh, black in y'all. <laughs> hear the groove, like, man. You know what? I think you're right, bro, because we all got that kind of crazy groove, you, you know? Do, you guys do, man, hardcore. And Crowbar's got that certain sound, and Craig and Jimmy, or uh, Jimmy and Craig, whatever order you want to put it in, kind of set the basis. They, they set the uh, the pace for it, and I just kind of picked up on it. And, you know, they got the – I used to – I like to call it the standard Crowbar beat. It's like on every album. You know, I've taken, taken it and literally um, – I've taken it and, like, literally, you know, just kind of went off of it and added to it and tried to pay respect to Jimmy and Craig and even Sid Muntz and Tony Costanza. You know, if uh, Kirk would have called me up after Odd Fellows Rest, I think I probably would have been the next drummer on Sonic Excess and Life's Blood for the Downtrodden, excuse me. Even though I'm on the album as my picture's on the album as I'm on it, but I didn't record it. It was Craig. It's the pain. Uh, you know what, man? My wife cooks some. Uh, usually, it's a big pot of something: beef stew, or meatballs and spaghetti, or uh, gumbo, or jambalaya. Well, this week it's uh, chicken noodle soup, and uh, I was feeling a little bit under the weather yesterday, so my wife cooked a big pot of that, and it's amazing, dude. You could eat that. I could eat it for like three to four days straight. So that's what's on the menu, brother, this weekend. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what, there's so many of them, it's hard to know. I, I probably forgot more tour stories than most people experience. <laughs> Those um, are the best ones. <laughs> you know, th there was really a cool one one night in Europe uh, with, with Crowbar. But um, we, we were, uh, we, you know, we had some pizzas at the end of the night. And everybody, it was a little small pizza, like, you know, each each person, each band member had their own individual pizza. And uh, some kind of way, Kirk Winstein's pizza disappeared. And we think that one of the techs gave it away to, like, one of the merch girls for the other band. So this this kind of went on for some hours in the in the tour bus. It was a Euro nightline. And we was with uh, a band from California called A, -A it was uh, AFA Armed for Apocalypse. We were with Armed for Apocalypse and uh, another band called Hamlet. And uh, Kirk's pizza got eaten anyway, long story short. So he kept coming up with all this crazy stuff at the end of the night about the, the something about the pizza theory, a conspiracy, that it was the phantom pizza and that, that never, ever was one. Oh, so shit. we kept hearing him mumbling from his bunk and everybody's trying to lay down and go to sleep. So... <laughs> He, he kind of, by the end of the night, he just got a little aggravated because everybody was eating pizza and he was stuck. So uh, Matt Brunson was sleeping right above him in the bunk right above him. And uh, Kurt kind of kicked and punched the bottom of the bunk and it was in two pieces, like in plywood. And next thing I know, I hear somebody screaming, help. And he literally, like, he went through the, the two pieces of plywood, caved in on Kurt. Matt Brunson, like, fell through the bunk, almost on top of Kirk, was basically supporting himself up in the bunk, trying to stop himself from falling on <laughs> Kirk. And Matt's like, dude, can you come help me? 
And uh, <laughs> there was been some just silly shit, absurd shit. <laughs> you know, like one night on my birthday, it was still in my drinking days. I was trying to reach for a bag that was on the other side of Matt at the back of the nightliner. And uh, he was sleeping, sitting up. And, uh, you know, the, bon- the, the bus was bouncing around. So when I tried to reach across him, uh, the bus kind of rocked back and forth and threw me into the window. And I tried to stick my left hand out and kind of like, kind of like uh, stiff arm the window. I freaking snapped my left shoulder out of socket. And I like I fell on top of Matt like face first into his chest. And he thought I was trying to attack him or something. <laughs> he woke up with me on top of him, like me screaming. But, uh, not, needless to say, he had to put my arm back on socket, back uh. in socket, and I had to go right back on stage the next day. We were opening up a Sepultura in Europe in 2000. Oh, holy uh, fuck. Yeah, some pretty pretty crazy shit happened over the years, man. Soil and Green had some hilarious stories, too, man. But I, I could go on all night, dude, with some of the ridiculous stories we had. How did that feel playing the next day, though, after your shoulder getting popped? Oh, yeah, I've done it a few times. But, oh, okay. You know, it, it's not any kind of uh, lethal weapon stuff going on. You can't just run over to a light post and slam your shit into a light post. It don't work, bro. That's movie stuff. <laughs> I'd be ass off if you did that. You but should- uh, you got to go down and let somebody pull it up, and you drop down to your knees, and that's the best uh, way to do it, bro. Uh, you know, uh, you can hear it and feel it, bro. But uh, uh, but that's the best way to do it. But that, that was definitely a, that was a brutal road story there. But, you know, nonetheless – the show must go on, and I was sore as hell the next day, but I got back on stage and, and uh, persevered through, man, and made the rest of the tour. Awesome. Uh, I think for the most part they are. I mean, don't get me wrong, the U.S. has got its hot spots where the fans sometimes just go absolutely ballistic. You know, you know we have our towns. I'm sure every band has that town that, you know, is a little, little bit more fan-friendly. But uh, there's no doubt, man, Europe's got that certain uh, type of vibe. It's an atmosphere and a vibe that's hard to catch and capture in the U.S. You know, the fans are very passionate. Not that the fans in the U.S. aren't. But um, the Euro festivals are where all the festival metal festivals originated. And it's really hard to capture that over here. I'm sure all these festivals that are happening, popping up everywhere in the U.S. are trying to capture that feel. But uh, good luck to them, man. It's really a unique thing. And, and if you ever been to one, it doesn't even matter which one, just go to one and you'll see what I'm talking about, man. There's no, there's no experience like the band Europe coming on stage, playing the final countdown, and everybody that's been waiting in beer lines for 15, 20 minutes to get a beer, they could be like the second person from the stand. And they'll run and totally be like, oh, well, the hell with the beer. Europe's on stage playing the final countdown so that everybody <laughs> will leave like Porta John lines, beer lines, and people will turn around and run for the festival grounds. And that'd be like every flag in the world you could imagine up in the air shaking. For nice. the final- Dude, it's the most insane thing for Man of War, Europe. I've never seen anything like it in my life at the Hellfest in France. You know, sometimes when you show up into a, a festival like Tusca, which is, I forgot what country it was in, but, uh, dude, I've never seen anything like it. That was one of the most rewarding shows after having to sleep outside of a airport that was closed. We got dropped off at, like, midnight. We couldn't get into our hotel room. We get to the airport. The airport's closed. We sleep on the sidewalk of the airport outside the doors. Wake up the next morning, jump on the flight. Dude, you're so delirious. We get to the festival. It's going straight to the back line to go look at the back line drum kit to go set up the rental drum kit and then go right to stage with hardly any time in between setting up the kit and going on stage. And I tell you, dude, it was one of the, it's, it was one of the most satisfying, gratifying things I've ever seen when we were playing under a tent stage and the whole crowd was just like, after the first song, it was like every song was like, Crowbar, crowbar. It was nice. the most insane thing I've ever seen. But you know, you just can't experience. I've never, I've never ever experienced anything like that in the states. Not yet. There's, there's certain moments that stuck in my mind, and it's definitely one of them. It'll give you chills down your spine and up your arms. You know. Fucking a, dude.